Hey guys and girls, thank you for joining me yet again. Today we're going to be talking of course about some camera gear and equipment, uh, some tips and tricks of course, uh, diffusion and also my new hard case. But, uh, we'll start off with a bit of a review of some of the new Nikon releases and of course all the rumours and gossip going out there on the interwebs. So uh, what I would like to start off with is talking about the new 400mm lens. Now I reckon that's very exciting. A 400 prime at f4.5, I think that's a great aperture and I think it'll be a wonderful product. So it's sort of very much uh, similar in structure I suppose you could be thinking to uh, the 100 to 400 zoom. However the big difference with this one is it's a little bit brighter and uh, the f-stop's a little bit uh, you know, bigger. And of course that makes it interesting with the f4.5 factor because I've had lenses around that category for some time. Previously I owned a uh, 200 to 400 zoom. It was a f4 lens. So it's almost exactly the same at 400 mils. 400 mils f4, 400 mils f4.5. Let's face it, there's really almost no difference in that. So all right, technically there's, it's a little bit darker maybe, but it's really not going to show up in your imagery at all. It's just such a little tiny difference. In fact, uh, really, you know, if you think about it like this, it's like having a, a prime like this here, and I've got an f1.2. And if you're shooting with a 50mm 1.2 or you're shooting with a 50mm 1.4, the difference you notice really in the imagery is very soft and very subtle. So is it better to always have a, a brighter aperture available? Yeah, absolutely. It always comes in handy. It comes down to the old philosophy, I suppose, that you can always drive a fast car slowly, but you can't drive a slow car fast. So having that scope of being able to open it right up as wide as possible is always an advantage. You don't have to use it, it's nice to have that option. But you've got to look at the practicality of it. Are you actually going to use anything brighter than that anyway? If you're shooting at 400 mils and you're shooting at say f2.8 for example, you're going to really struggle to get anything in focus. Because let me explain something to you. And we, the context of this is uh, with birding for example. And I suppose sports action or birding is going to be its most likely category of use. See when you think about for example, we're talking about birds for example, a bird's head. A bird's head you may think is elongated and uh, very uh, conical, but it's actually not so. It's actually very much almost a spherical arrangement of bird's head. It just looks long because it has a long beak and then there's a long neck coming out the other end. So it's like an optical illusion. It sort of has this tendency of looking very drawn out and thin. But the actual face of the bird with its eye is actually very spherical like this ball. And so when you try and get a pinpoint of focus in a shallow depth of field in any one area, say for the eye, you'll get the eye in focus, but most of the rest of the head could be very well out of focus at f2.8 at 400 mils or greater. So I uh, just wanted to illustrate that, that often we think we need something and we actually don't, and it can actually be more of a hindrance and a help. So uh, when you're, say, photoing at 400 mils a deer or a larger animal like a dog, that can be fine. But if you're getting really tight into a small object, you'll find that because of your proximity to fill the frame, uh, you're getting almost nothing in focus. So don't be scared to open up that aperture. I've been shooting a lot with my 400mm configuration recently at up to 7.1, up to f8, and still struggling to get the whole creature in focus simply because I'm getting so damn close to it. And speaking on birding, and we're talking about a lens that would be suitable for something like that, uh, when you approach uh, the creature, try not to startle it by approaching it too quickly. I know it's tempting when you see something on a branch, a bird, there, a little sparrow, and you think, oh, now what I'll do is I'll just rush up and get the photo, and of course your thing flies away. It's terrified. thinks it's just, you know, about to pounce on it like it's prey. So obviously you want to take your time, you stalk it, a little bit of uh, sensible clothing always helps, you know, you don't have to have full camouflage of course, but if you can just have something that's subtle and uh, not blary bright colours to draw attention to yourself. And uh, when you approach the uh, bird, and we're all saying say that was the bird, when you approach it don't come straight towards it, always come like sideways in a Z pattern if you like. It's easy with a Nikon Z to think of a Z isn't it? So uh, just approach it in a very slow steady Z pattern left to right and be very uh, patient in your uh, approach, even stopping at certain times, just so you're not constantly even moving. And you can find you can get really, really close into your subject, and uh, that'll uh, fill the frame and it'll look fantastic. So you don't always need more than 400 mils. In fact, I've rarely had to use more than 400 mils for any subject, even those tiny little sparrows that I'll show you photos and samples of, I found that I could get up within, you know, two meters of these birds if you take your time and you're patient. So uh, 400mm is great focal length and I'm thinking this is going to be an excellent lens. I love the idea it's a prime. 
uh, Prime is a fantastic idea because you often get uh, better optical quality. It's probably marginal because of zooms these days and I look when I go out at the moment I'm using my 70 to 200 and of course what I do is I put this teleconverter on it, it's a two times teleconverter and of course 200 with the teleconverter is 400 mils. Now uh, it's a 2.8 lens of course but with the teleconverter it doubles that and it ends up 5.6. So I'm shooting most of my birding at 5.6 at 400 mils. So as you can see this new lens at 4.5 is an improvement on that. It's improves your options and your scope. Gives you a bit more of a blurry background, a bit more of a brighter image. And that's never at a loss. That's always a good thing to do. So uh, if just because you've got 4.5 available, you may be choosing to shoot at f8 just for the fact of getting more in focus. And if you're worrying about darkness, if say you're thinking, well, maybe I should really invest in the 400 2.8 because it's so much brighter. Well, yes, it is brighter, and it's great when you're shooting in the evenings or early mornings, and maybe the light is not so great. But in broad daylight, you're not going to want that 2.8. That's going to be chronically uh, bright and uh, very excessive. But uh, when the lighting is poor, I'm actually recommending people use this. So let me just illustrate. I always like to put something on the bench here and show you what I'm talking about. So uh, here I have my uh, lens. Now, uh, I'll put the teleconverter on. What the hell? It doesn't take too long, does it? So I'll just very quickly put this on just to illustrate what I'm talking about and how I actually apply everything. Very important, of course, the projecting in there that you see sticking out. Don't put that towards the sensor. It goes the other way around. That goes inside the lens. I love to tell people that as many times as I can because the more times you hear it, less chance you've got of doing something silly and damaging a camera. So here we have, look, we've got it all on. I just make it safe with all those accessories over there. And uh, we're saying we're going to do some uh, bird photography. And now I've got 400 mils, should I wish it. So when I uh, set the uh, item for that, and I'll just do that to make sure everything's as I say it is. Yep, so you can see it's on the 200 mil register there. And uh, if I just uh, click the buttons around, it actually says 400 mils there on the lens. So I'm shooting 400 mils. It'll now be uh, 5.6. Even if I set the camera at 2.8, I can't because it'll only shoot at 5.6 with the teleconverter on. So when I'm uh, shooting here at uh, 5.6 and it's a bit of a gloomy day and I need to brighten things up, what I'll do is I'll literally put a speed light on my camera. Now you might be saying to yourself initially, oh, what are you talking about? Speed light's not good when a subject's a long way away. Well, actually it can be quite good and I'll just illustrate how you can use it. So here I have a speed light and of course as it is, it will just give a broad flash of light in every direction as it were. So if you use something like this, and I don't think, I think you can pick that up when I show you it, it's a uh, honeycomb grid. And the advantage of the honeycomb grid is it's now concentrating the light in a very firm direction. So that's channeling the light now at the subject. And it just helps that little bit more to make sure that uh, the light is only on the subject. And it's also not startling other creatures that might be close by as well. So uh, or you might startle a creature you're photoing, but that's, that's the one you're drawing attention to anyway. So hopefully you get a few good shots in before it gets spooked and flies away. But on a dark, gloomy situation, this is exactly what you need to make that subject pop. So uh, I'd always believe that getting the first two or three quality photos is more important than sitting there and rattling off, uh, you're filling your buffer with crap photos because they're dark dull. So uh, this way, you, at least the one or three your photos you do get are gonna be excellent and bright. So that's a real solution at 400 mils to get a bright subject if it's a gloomy day, rather than worrying about aperture all the time or ISO. Because aperture and ISO, well, they can actually negatively affect the image, particularly the ISO if you try and crank that up too much. So I leave my ISO always around you know, 64 native, maybe up to 100 or 200, but I never go beyond 200. If I need more light, I simply add light. So that's just my recommendation. You may feel differently, but I found it works and I can show you photo samples to prove that that works. So these honeycomb grids that I just mentioned here, these are like $25 items. They're very cheap. You buy them online at eBay or whatever. They come with a variety of different uh, honeycomb grid filters to and, you know, concentrate the light at different beams. So I think I can't remember what it was exactly, but it's something like you get, you know, so many percent. 20, 30, 50%, uh, whatever the range is. But uh, yeah, a great little item. They're very light, plastic. They don't weigh anything. And uh, I think they're awesome to bring along with you in the kit when you need that extra punch of light on the subject.
But getting back to the cameras at hand here, we were talking here about uh, the 400mm. And uh, loving, as I said, the fact that it's a prime. I think Nikon uh, should be releasing a lot more primes now. That's actually the extra thing they can do for us. Because uh, you, know, you want all the optical quality you get, especially when you're taking photos of wildlife. So it's uh, beautiful to get the details and the feathers or the scales or the insect's eyes or whatever you're taking a photo of. So I do like the use of a prime lens. Now that's not detracting any way from the zooms that they're producing. Uh, the reason I have a series of zooms now, and I have the holy trinity, if you like, of Nikon zooms, and uh, I find that uh, the zooms are actually astoundingly good. Right now I'm filming with the 24 to 70. Uh, that's the uh, 2.8 S lens, and that's a magnificent lens for video. I, I love that for video because that range is so cool. You know, you can get into a tight room, and I'll do this a little later on where I'll reconfigure the arrangement. I'll uh, bring it back from the 50 mil it's on now to about uh, 24 to 30 mil, and I'll be filling the room up a little more because I'll have to stand up and demonstrate some products very soon. But just the fact that it's just a twist of a dial to do that, not having to swap lenses, well, that's fantastic. And as I've mentioned too, I'm using the 70 to 200 zoom for all manner of things, from portraiture to uh, birding, wildlife and festivals, because the image quality is so good. There were times when zooms weren't so fantastic. You know, you did have a bit of a compromise from a prime, but now well, actually the, the zooms are quite outstandingly great. So I'm uh, certainly not ashamed to be using them in any way. I think they're wonderful and very versatile. But primes, that's a different league altogether. And the fact that you can usually get a brighter aperture uh, makes them very useful. And so, you know, as you know, I've got the 51.2 here and I'll um, probably undoubtedly be getting the 85 1.2 and that comes out as well for my portraiture use. So uh, anyway, that's the summary of that uh, particular lens that we're talking about, the 400. Uh, I do uh, find it interesting, it has a 95 um, millimeter filter, I believe. I think it was 95. Yeah, so it's quite a uh, large diameter filter. You probably have to buy some new filters, or if you have, uh, say, a 112 mil filter, you might be able to stop, you know, reduce that down with a converter. But uh, I, don't, I was a bit sad on the fact that you would have to buy another filter if you needed filters. But uh, however, I think at uh, 4.5, you probably won't need to use a lot of filters to darken the image and reduce glare and so on. So just, uh, yeah, that's, it's a great option. I think it's magnificent. The next thing I want to talk about is the Z30. Now that's been pretty much confirmed. It's coming out very soon. Uh, it's an entry level camera. And, uh, yeah, entry level cameras are a great idea to introduce people into the system and get them comfortable with using a camera, uh, have some manual settings, getting familiar, a little collection of decent lenses together. And if you've only been using your phone, well then that's a, a step up. But be honest with you, if I think you're a Nikon user now and you've already got some decent equipment, you know, you, it doesn't matter what model it particularly is, whether it be a Z50 or uh, be a Z6 or Z7 or Z9, really doesn't matter. But if you've already got a decent uh, Nikon Z camera, I would actually not recommend you to buy the Z30 because I think it's too much of a step down for you. I don't think there's going to be a lot of application. Uh, I think actually you're probably better off just using a quality mobile phone in that situation. So there's not that going to be that much difference, I'll be honest with you, with the Z30 to a very good quality mobile phone in most of the imagery and practical use. Uh, and I think our phones today are coming up really well. They're never going to replace a decent uh, you know, digital camera that we have here. That's a different league. However, for something that's entry level compared to a very high quality mobile phone, if you've already got a great mobile phone, you've spent some good money on it, just use that you know, as a backup. So guys, thank you. I've just uh, packed away all the camera gear that was in front of me just to make it safe and out the way because we're going to just move on to a, a different subject if you like. And that is actually, we're going to review some of the uh, camera equipment that's uh, been on the market recently. Now everybody uh, knows we've got the uh, Z7 I came out recently and then there's the Z7 II for example and they're projecting that there could very well be a Z7 III released at the end of the year, although that's not guaranteed yet. But we do have a range of cameras, everything from the Z9 down to the uh, Z30 coming out very soon and I just wanted to review uh, some of the differences between the DSLR ranges that happened in the past, say for example the D800, D850 and the D5, D6 and uh, the difference between the new modern mirrorless cameras. I'm just going to summarise it very quickly because I think this needs to be said, there's some details that need to be brought out. Now it is true that some people, and I'm probably guilty of being one of them, that's uh, complained a little bit about things like firmware upgrades and features that we would like in our new cameras that we haven't quite received as yet. And uh, I'm still a bit gripey about the fact that the Z9, for example, has uh, been released only very recently, and it's already getting a 2.1 
uh, firmware upgrade coming out next week. And I'm thinking, well, how can they be on 2.1 and the Z7 II that I've paid a lot of money for uh, over a year ago, and it's still on a firmware 1.4. We're not even up to that stage yet. Z9's way ahead of that. So it feels like a little unfair, like we've been left behind, if you like. And uh, some people may be griping that they've made a poor investment or the cameras aren't what they should be. Well, in review of that, I just got to say, being all frankness and honesty, that it's really not that big an issue. Uh, look at you, what I like a greater firmware upgrade to improve video tracking performance, etc. Well, yeah, sure, that's always an advantage to have something that's a little bit better than it was. And I believe that will come. It's just that I get a little bit impatient, as many probably do, because we want everything now, don't we? It's uh, my have a saying, and it's uh, I, can, I can be a patient man, I can wait as long as you like, as long as I get everything I want yesterday. Well, unfortunately, that's just not how life works. Sometimes you just have to be patient and wait. So that's what I'm encouraging people to do. But let's have a focus not on what we might think we don't have yet. Let's actually focus on what we do have. Now, I remember back in the days of the uh, DSLRs, and, uh, particularly fond memories of my DA10 use in the past, which is a wonderful camera, and I got fantastic shots from that. But I remember the frustration in the day of having only a little cluster of focus points in the middle of the screen and having to... Uh, Focus and then recompose, focus and recompose. So what am I talking about here? Well, for those who don't know and not familiar with the old uh, DSLR cameras, what would happen is you would uh, set, uh, you would find your little focus spot and you would only have a few little focus spots in the middle of the screen here. Maybe 11 or 20 or something like that, but it was never more than that. And uh, you would have to get your focus exactly in the center, get focus and register focus, and then move the camera for composition. And it was actually quite frustrating because you'd get focus and then you'd have to go, okay, eh, click. Because you couldn't, you couldn't change focus later on. It was a back button focus. So you'd only activate the focus on the back of the camera. Once that was set, then you could move and click. And the clicking didn't change the focus at all because that wasn't focusing here. The focus was at the back button unit. So you'd let go of that once you had focus. It would lock on the focus there. And then you could take your photo and uh, you would get composition correctly. You were limited because of the small focus pocket that you had in the center of the screen. So uh, what we found now is with the new mirrorless system, regardless of which camera it is, you've pretty much got the entire screen available full of focus points to uh, not have to do that now. So now you can just set your focus point right on the top corner if you wish, and that's what you want to take a photo of, and uh, that's sharp as a tack now. Now that's a beautiful luxury that a lot of people have forgotten to appreciate. It was a novelty when it first came out. Maybe everybody's taking for advantage now and not really thinking about it too much, but that is a wonderful new feature to be able to focus anywhere on the screen that you want and not have to you know, focus and then recompose and perhaps lose everything. Because as you move slightly, if you're doing a very shallow depth of field and you're having to move the camera to compose the shot properly, uh, you can actually slightly lose your focus. You've gone from maybe the eye now to the tip of the nose or eye to the eyebrow because you've had to actually physically move the camera. So that was a bit of a concern in the past. Uh, it's a skill that you can acquire and master. You get to know after a while exactly how to shift the camera proportional to your movement so you're not changing the focus. But it was uh, it's just an extra thing you had to think about. And now with mirrorless cameras, you don't have to do that. And particularly with the Z6, Z7 line now, uh, that's a really awesome option to have a full frame of focusing points. Uh, as far as video tracking goes, well, I've got it on video tracking now. I've got it on widescreen, so it's the entire screen is basically available to find my face. And I'm sure you're realizing now that uh, it works very well. It, it requires focus and keeps it very stuck and tight. Now I'm going to stand up a little later on and demonstrate my hard case, and I'll be shuffling around quite a bit, and you'll see yourself that it follows me 100%, and it's never an issue. So it's not really a, a, a poor focusing system at all. What we're really consistently talking about here is just that any incremental change or improvement we can get is greatly appreciated, and we should appreciate what we have already. Because back in the day of DSLRs, when you tried to get the, the, the tracking focus going on then in video, you can forget it. It was atrociously bad, and it was always pulling focus. So it would focus and focus back and focus in and focus back, and you were constantly losing focus. And I laugh about it now, but it was no laughing matter at the time when you're trying to get video. Most of the time, all they did was manually focus because it just wasn't worth trying to use the autofocus and the old DSLRs. So let's appreciate what we got. That's really what I'm saying. We've got a lot to be grateful for. And let's be happy we have it. The image quality, of course, is still excellent. I don't think really the image quality per se has improved that dramatically from the DSLRs as far as photography goes. 
The photos I have in the past were astoundingly great, and the photos I have now with the new cameras, the mirrorless system, are also great. So I don't really see that it's we've lost or gained much of anything there, but it's all the little features and uh, trinkets that come along with it, like a 4K at 60 frames per second, or uh, having the full screen of focusing points, uh, having all the adjustments readily available and quick, and, and just the snappy technology faster frames per second, for example, and these sort of features have made the photography a lot more exciting with the mirrorless system. Of course, it's also upgraded a lot the lens quality, so it's not so much that the build quality of the lenses is any better or worse, but it's more a question of the fact that they've just technically been able to improve the uh, structure of it. A bit more science in it, I suppose, now. We've stepped up a bit in the modern era. Yeah, so we're just discussing there the uh, concept of the new technology coming out in the lenses that's made them that little bit better. So uh, how can I illustrate that? Well, I'll illustrate it with things like, for example, this 51.2, for example. Now, back in the day, they, they made a 51.4 and they made an 85 1.4, for example, with the DSLR system. And they were great lenses. I'm not going to say they're not good lenses, but uh, they're nowhere near as sharp and as snappy as the modern Z equivalents we have now. So again, this is where I'm saying that uh, the, it's not that they didn't try hard enough back in the day, they were just limited with technology. We've got great technology now. Let's take advantage of that and be happy that it's available for us and be appreciative of what we have and the options that we have and the options that are ever increasing. For example, like the 400 f 4.5 coming out and uh, the fact that we uh, so very soon have an 85 1.2, that we've got now the 400 2.8 TC, uh, big prime, and then of course we'll have a 600 version very similar to that as well very soon. So the technology is just booming and things are coming out. I know it can seem a bit slow, but uh, we've just got to suck it up and be a little patient. Because if you remember, remember the days of other camera manufacturers? Let's review that. Let's just put Nikon aside for a minute and view, remember when uh, Panasonic came out and they were starting to bring out their GH series and they had the GH1, GH2, GH3, 4, 5 and now the 6. Now do you remember how many cameras that is? It took them a long time and a lot of cameras to get up to the quality that they have today. The first ones were okay but they were limited in ability and the focusing was terrible. Uh, the old first Panasonic GH cameras were atrocious at focusing, but uh, they've got better and better and better and better, and now they're up to a stage where they're really quite excellent. But uh, that's Micro Four Thirds, for example. Uh, if we have a look at something that's similar to the Nikon products today, we've got now uh, the Sony's, for example. Now, the Sony's started off the whole regime, didn't they, in full frame and mirrorless cameras, but they didn't start off with an A1, did they? No, they started off with an A7 I and then an A7 II. Now, if you remember the A7 I, it was pretty much atrocious at focusing. It was overheating, the battery life was terrible, and it took them several cameras in rapid concession to get them up to, say, an A7 III, where it was actually a usable unit and practical. Now, I've used some of these cameras. I hired them, and I've owned them, and I know that they're actually quite a good camera. But they had a lot of limitations too when they first came out, especially the first and second series were pretty ordinary cameras, quite frankly, and they were actually getting mocked by a lot of people. I mean, I remember Nikon and Canon users used to laugh at the Sonys when they first came out because they were having so much grief and problems with them. Now, of course, I've obviously they've mastered that, but it's taken them, what, five or six years to do so. So let's just give Nikon a couple more years to get on top of everything and, and iron out the bugs, and I'm sure they'll be right up there with them. So it's not their, their fault as it were. They had a long, long history of DSLR manufacturer, and uh, when you understand that uh, Nikon had uh, such a history, it would have taken them a long time to sort of get over that, particularly when you had maybe some old-school management in the uh, system there, and they were not maybe too much uh, keen to uh, go on to the next stage and leave all their experience and tradition behind them. So I, I get that, but they are moving forward and they are bringing out some beautiful products. So let's be grateful for what we do have. So uh, moving on to the next stage of the conversation is actually diffusion and uh, how we can uh, soften the lighting because having the best camera in the world doesn't help us if our lighting is atrocious. So uh, what can we do? Well, I want to illustrate for you, uh, I'll show you up a picture up on the uh, screen there that I have quite a lot of these diffusion panels. Now they're those little scrunchy ones you put into a little satchel and you pop them open and, and then you go, you've got some diffusion instantly. I'll be showing you some of them. So I'll show you, I have actually a multiple of them just try and find one that's not too massive here that I can show you. So here we go. This is a very common size one that I'll uh, be using as I uh, go around for photography and there's multiple purposes to them. 
as you can see by the uh, branding here, now the branding is not important, I'm not a branding type guy. Okay, I use Nikon because I had to make a choice and I like their product. But that doesn't mean that they're 100% better than every other manufacturer. They're just another manufacturer, but they do a good job. Now this particular branding here, Impact. I found them very good. I buy a lot of stuff from B&H. And uh, B&H have this Impact brand, and I was quite impressed with them for value for money. So let me just walk you through the value for money aspect of it and show you what I like about them. So I'm going to pop this open, and it's going to pop and explode a little bit. So just, there, there we go. All right, we've done it. So uh, this is quite a large one. This is the 40. 40 inch version. Now sometimes I do a, a verbal faux pas and I'll say centimetre by mistake, but no sorry, it is. this is a 40 inch version. It's quite a large one. And this is the one I bring around with me when I take it into my uh, camera case. So you may have seen I had a Velcro package uh, inside the lid and I fold this up and I put it in there and it's always available for me wherever I go. And it's sort of stuck to the inside of the lid of my camera bag now. And uh, so this is the one I use. Now what do I like about it? Well apart from the fact that it has a wonderful diffusion and a nice soft scrim there, I'll just fold this down again now. Excuse me. There we go. If we fold it in, you can see it's actually pretty easy to do that. Uh, and uh, what I like about this is the feature here of the handles. So you notice here, it's got handles either side of it. And it gives you something to grip and hold onto that's quite comfortable. And that's particularly useful when you want to project it out and you've actually got a handle and you're not having to hold the actual scrim itself, the, the screening, and either tear it or dirty it up with dirty fingers. So it's great that they've actually got a proper functional handle there. But the beauty of the handle is actually here where they have uh, a tap they have a one quarter and three eighth option uh, thread so that you can actually mount these to light stands or uh, you know a monopod and use it as like an extension pole and bring it out or mount it firmly on a platform on your tripod and uh, shoot through them if you wish to do that for diffusing your flash or light. You can also use them as I like to use them mostly and that is a lot of the time I have them opened up of course and up high and they're diffusing the sun from someone's face. So you can utilize the sun as if it were a speed light if you like and with this diffusion here you get a beautiful soft glow over the subject. It's also particularly useful when there's speckledy light. This is my cursed thing that you go into the shade under trees and it's got ambient light which is very nice and now it's a little bit softer on the eyes for the person and, and a little bit darker and not so harsh with the light but unfortunately sometimes the light will speckle through the leaves and you'll get this spot of light here and a spot of light there and a spot of light there and it's very annoying so even though it's generally shady these spots of light can destroy your photo and this is where having something like this up in the uh, up in the air on a tripod or someone holding it in front of the face it diffuses that light and stops that speckletiness which is uh, magnificent so let me just put this big thing down because if I don't put this away it's going to pop open on me and be a bit annoying, but I do highly recommend having as uh, you know having a few of these for variety. They come in a, a multitude of sizes. That one there I was just showing you was the 40, but I also have uh, the 22 inch, the 32 inch. That's actually a 42 inch, to be honest with you. 40 just rounds it off in my mind. It's a 42 inch, and then I have the very large 52 inch. Now that's a massive one, but that's fantastic for big soft light. So you know, if you've got uh, multiple speed lights on a cluster and you want to shoot through to get some power, but you want to diffuse that, that big uh, scrim is fantastic. So uh, what I'm going to do is just illustrate it in a minor scale. So let's just drop this right down as an illustration down to this little baby here. Now this is the 22 inch one. Now what's all this about? Well this is just here, I'm, I'm using this to show you how uh, versatile they can be. So uh, if I put this up on the bench here, I can illustrate with a little tripod and I'm just going to have a little tripod here, it's a baby tripod if you like, and I'll put my speed light on this for you. There we go, just lock that on, make sure it doesn't uh, come off. And I'll show you what I do. So what I'll be doing is I'll have my speed light here, if I can just not destroy half the room here. I'll try and show you what I'm doing. There we are. And there's my speed light. And then what you can do is you can have now a diffusion and you shoot through it. So you can see there what's going on, it's just wobbling around now because I've moved it. But there you go, you have it nice and still and you shoot your speed light through this diffusion screen and you're going to have a great soft light. So this is a mini version of what I do, a mini setup, but it does illustrate I think quite nicely just how you can rig it up. See, obviously you would have a bigger tripod, wouldn't you? You'd have a full size tripod out on site, you have your speed light up high, uh, you could even have a little diffusion dome or uh, flick the little uh, diffusion panel there if you like to help soften the light or broaden it out a little bit more. And then as you shoot through here, you've got a beautiful soft glow then. And so that's 
very portable. I mean, these are extremely lightweight. They pack away, as you saw, you scrunch them up and then they're just a little package in your camera bag. And they're something you can take with you anywhere without any fuss or bother and have some great results. So I just wanted to show you through that and to demonstrate it for you physically. And I think that they're wonderful units and I highly encourage you to buy as, you know, as many as you can to have them handy, different sizes. So sometimes you don't want a big unit. If you're doing some product photography, for example, that little one is quite excellent to have with you. Because uh, even though I have uh, soft boxes, I have large octo boxes ranging from 80, uh, 80 uh, centimeters all the way up to 120. Uh, the thing about those things is they're quite awkward to set up and they take a bit of time and a lot of bulk and a lot of space. And if you're doing some shoots inside a room, you may not have all the room for a big octo box being set up. And it's about practicality, isn't it? You know, like you've heard of these uh, parabolic umbrella or uh, parabolic uh, soft boxes. And uh, they can be anything up to about 10 foot in diameter. Now, that's awesome for the lighting effect that they provide, but totally gross for the practicality factor. So they're awesome in a studio, but if you can't take something like that out on the site, can you, out in the park, it's ridiculous. And it'll get blown over and get damaged, or you're gonna hurt someone. Uh, so you've gotta have horses for courses. And so these little diffusion panels are light, easy to maneuver around, and uh, you know, if you've got someone to help you out, they can hold them and you don't even need a tripod, perhaps. So uh, yeah, great idea, I think. Definitely use things like that. Any tools you can have, excuse me, that uh, make your day a little bit more uh, pleasant and make the end results uh, more soft and beautiful, well, I'm highly encouraging you to go ahead with that. So of course I'm using that right now on my video light. I'm using the, uh, I think it's a 32 inch version in front of my 180 watt DNO light for video. And uh, that's giving us a nice soft glow result now. Now that light is a, a broad light soft panel anyway. It's about uh, 300 millimeters by 400 millimeters and it's a diffused light panel. However, with the scrim in front of it, it, it just accentuates that lovely soft glow that you get around the room. Now there is one negativity I should draw out, to be honest about them, is when you use something like these uh, diffusion panels, because they're not enclosed like a softbox is, you do get a lot of stray light. So you'll get light bouncing backwards on them, bouncing around the room. So if you wanted absolute control of the lighting, well, they're not good for that. You're really off, better off with an octo box that's uh, containing the light and project it only forward, and maybe even a grid in the front to direct that light where you want it that's soft. But for quick and uh, quick and easy use in a hurry, they do give nice soft light. So I'll show you a picture of that one being used uh, right now. So uh, getting back to the next subject at hand, what we're going to do is talk now about this hard case. Now I bought recently a very uh, large hard case, and I love this thing. It's fantastic and very versatile. I did an extensive video on it just recently. But what I'm going to do now is show you a modification I've made to it, just to uh, extend on how good and practical it can be to use. And uh, you know, I always think that if you can add a little something to it, rather than buy a new one, well that's the way to go. So let me run you through that. I'm going to have to refocus a bit here. I'm going to have to expand the shot and have a wider screen image and stand up. So while I set that up, uh, just give me a few seconds to prepare that and I'll snip right into that segment. So here we are again guys. I've, as you can see I've reframed and I've got a broad shot of the room here and uh, here's my uh, bench and of course we're going to put uh, some stuff up here and I'll demonstrate it for you. So just to start off the subject let's uh, get in context of what I was talking about. In the past I was talking about this uh, diffusion panel. A diffusion box here, soft box if you like to call it that, on the speed light. So it's really all focused around one speed light. It's a large uh, I think it's the SB910, uh, quite a powerful speed light. It's uh, remotely triggered, of course, as you can see here, and I've got it on a frame and structure. It's centered around this uh, rogue flash bender, and then I've got a diffusion box sitting over the top with some Velcro. Now, I actually did a, a lengthy demonstration of how it all came together last video, so I'm not going to go over too much detail on it, only that I found it extremely useful when you're out on site. So if you're going out in a park and you're taking some portraits, it's an excellent option to have this sort of thing in remote photography mode, be able to take a photo and have something nice and soft that you can get right in close to the subject when you need that in order to get a soft light. So obviously the closer it is to the subject, the closer in you're getting, the softer the light source, further back a little bit more specular. And of course it's not a huge softbox, is it? It's not like some sort of like 120 circular octo box, but of course this is something you can actually take with you when you get around. And it's 
packable and actually able to transport and it doesn't have a lot of wind uh, application where it's going to be blown over and cause a nuisance because it's not a giant umbrella. So that's actually the item I'm going to illustrate initially and then I'll talk a bit more about photography equipment. But uh, this is actually a useful thing to demonstrate now with the hard case because my, my difficulty was that even though this is a fantastic unit and quite uh, compact in comparison to many other light sources, it was still a bit bulky to bring around and I wasn't sure how to transport it. I could put it inside the hard case but if I did that it actually taking up most of the hard case and then I didn't have a lot of room for my accessories that I like and that's the whole reason I bought the case was for all the accessories. So I was trying to puzzle out how I can make and incorporate the two and I came up with a solution and I'd like to show you it. Now this may or may not be practical for everyone but it's quite doable for everyone and it certainly does work. So whether you've got this exact light source or not it doesn't matter you can incorporate this with any sort of manner of speed lights or you know studio strobes etc because it will work with anything providing you simply have a suitable bracket to mount to. So let me just show you how it all works all right I'll go get the case up and then I'll show you how I incorporate the two without losing any room inside my new hard case. So here is my hard case here, and I'll just bring it up on the bench. As you can see, it's empty because that's why I can lift it so easily. It's quite a big, heavy unit other than that. So it's a great hard case. It is the HP RC 2745W. That's the uh, registration number of it. So I'll just show you up there. For those who may not have seen this video or seen this uh, case before, it's a large hard case. It has magnificent structure to it. It's very robustly built. I can stand on top of this uh, without any issue at all and take photos or use it for a bit of extra elevation. But the handles here are extremely strong. If you have a look at these handles here, you'll notice that they have a nice uh, turquoise grip. It's rubberized and very soft. The hinges are hugely strong. In fact, you can support an entire full case of some 30 kilograms easily just with any one handle so they're very very strongly built uh, they're never going to break or get damaged and if they do they have a lifetime warranty anyway but I'm not here to sell cases what I'm here to do is just illustrate how I've used them so here I've got a large case I can fill it up with all sorts of goodies and then I'm very happy to go on my photography use but how do I get that flash around with me well I was thinking about the handle structure and I noticed that in there they have some little slots the little black slots and what that is is just there's a plastic barrier in the middle of them and then the rubberized coating goes around that and so I thought you know what I could drill holes in here and then mount things to these handles should I want to without in any way damaging or compromising the integrity of these units so I thought well I'm going to have a go at doing exactly that so what I did is I didn't need to use this particular handle although that's it's a good handle but there are handles all over it and I thought well what handle can I use and I could use this one here at this end so let me just illustrate that I've got to be very careful here that I don't have things out of frame or out of sight but uh, if I can bring this around here just gently and I can show you what's going on we've got a handle up the top here handle to transport the you know the case around but it had a little auxiliary handle here as you can see up on top and you can see I put a little frame on top now this little frame is a very simple structure it's nothing particularly complicated or difficult it's just a piece of aluminium I've bent into an L shape a little L bracket and I uh, bolted it on with a few nuts and uh, some little thumb screws and I've got here some Arco Swiss uh, clamps now I'm using two clamps Arco Swiss clamps simply because it gives me a bit more strength and variety of options so I'll give you close-up pictures onto how they're mounted exactly and how it's used in just a moment. Now I have it around backwards to you. Excuse me if I just bring this around a little bit. You can see a bit better if I turn it around. If I turn it around this way you can probably pick up the Arco Swiss mounts and the clamps and how it's all mounted. But I'm going to turn the case around the other way because I need to see what I'm doing. I need to see where all those buttons and knobs are so I can demonstrate. So here we go. So I've got it around this way. Now you might say, well, what is the point of that? Like it just looks like it's something that's in the way and annoying. But no, it's actually an extremely versatile tool. So here I have my light. And I was thinking, how do I mount this to my uh, case? And I developed this situation where I can easily mount it now and have a lot of versatility. Now I use the Arco Swiss mount on the bottom of that frame. Lock it in here. And as you can see in a moment of seconds, now I can take my light around with me anywhere I want to go and it's completely sturdy and firm 
just it'll naturally now, while the shape of the handle and the hinge, flop into that position, which is extremely transportable for me. So I lose none of the volume inside the case, but I gain the use of this in a moment's notice. So when I'm around, should I have, say, the camera on a, a, a camera bag or on a neck strap or something like that, and it's on my body, and I need to access this light, it's just a matter of two little thumb screws, and out she comes and I can have that accessible anytime I want. So the fact that it was just so quick to put in and out was wonderful for me. It takes a few seconds and it's super, super secure. Notice I have the two 50 mil clamps here in order to secure it, and I have a very long 100 mil uh, plate, Arca Swiss plate. And what that does, it gives me some options here in variety. So I can see, it's like on a slider. I can slide it in very tight. I can loosen it out if I've got a different feature, fitting or fixture, and I can adjust it now. It's got a, like a sliding mechanism. The two grippers also mean that uh, what, what that helps is with security. It's never coming off. It's not relying on any one thumb screw. It's got two of them to secure it. So I never think or concern about this thing dropping to the ground. These handles are extremely strong. They're never going to let go or break. So I'm not frightened of that either. It's very strong. They're a very robust material. And with two bolts there to secure it, I'm never going to be concerned about that coming off. Now let me just drop this down a bit for you. If I drop this down here now, and you can see how it's sort of sitting nice and flush and flat there, uh, you might say to yourself, Mark, that's uh, fantastic. Uh, you've got it all sorted there with your flash and uh, your, all your gear in your camera case. But uh, how do you access your camera case now, mate? You've got this thing sitting on top of the, of the, top of the, hand, uh, the hood. Well, it's actually very simple. The very nature of a hinged handle is that it moves. So it's never going to be in the way. So when I want to access my stuff, and let's face it, you only access stuff in the camera bag when it's flattened down on the ground. If you try and access it when it's up, it's all going to spill to the ground, isn't it? So you're going to have it nice and steady and flat. And when you do, voila, how easy was that? Isn't that fantastic? This is the natural cause of the handle. I'm not modifying the case or handle in any way. I've just put this L bracket on with a few clamps and all of a sudden now not only can I attach the speed light and diffuser but I can get immediate access to my camera bag in a, a few seconds notice. So let me just open this up and you can see here what I'm talking about. Very very quick, very very simple and easy. No problem at all. When I finish getting all my stuff together I'll just shut this up. Excuse the noise, I know it can get quite noisy this. There we go, and I uh, finished with my gear and put that down again, and off I go and I'm starting to trolley off again. Now you notice in the shape of the uh, trolley and the case here, that this naturally now will fall into a very safe and secure position. It doesn't move around or rattle about. So that's fantastic, if I want to get rid of it, it only requires a few thumb screws to remove that whole fitting, should I want to remove it. So that's the uh, item here that I wanted to show you that I've made, this little bracket. Uh, of course, I'll have to demonstrate with the close-up photos. You can see how it's all put together and why. But a very simple procedure. There's only two little drill holes in the handle. Now, this is something I want to uh, emphasize uh, over and over again. I am not drilling into the case. I'm not drilling into the lid. I'm not drilling into the structure of the case because you don't want to compromise its sealing and protection, dust proofing and waterproofing. What you're doing is you're not drilling into the case. You're drilling into a handle which is detached and can be replaced at a moment's notice. Anytime you want a replacement part, you can always ring in and book and get a new handle if you thought you damaged it or stuffed it up. But what you don't want to do is book in a whole new case because you've been silly drilling holes all through it and mucking it up. So just I want to emphasize that one more time, you don't drill into the case for any reason at all. But the handles that are separate from the case, uh, that well, that's up for grabs, I think. <laughs> Literally, a bit of a pun there, isn't it? So uh, thank you. I just want to show you that one. Now I'm going to step onto another structure now, and I'm going to show you a second use for this bracket that might impress you. I'm just going to remove the light there, put that down there somewhere safe. There we go. That's out of the way now. And uh, the other use I have now for it is with the camera believe it or not. So let's say you don't need to take uh, that big uh, light with you. You may have a light just on your camera. So you can have a speed light, say, mounted to the uh, camera if you wanted and you didn't need to access two items. You can use this with the camera. There's multiple ways you can mount it. I mean, you can have it here, as I've got it here. With a, I've got an L bracket, so the L bracket makes it uh, extremely convenient. But if I put this L bracket in, I'll just tighten that down. There we go, and you can see you can mount your camera to it. So you might say, how is that practically useful? Well, I think you can just about see that in there, see how it is. What I'll do is I'll drop this down a bit so you can actually see it down below. 
So if I drop this down to this level here, sort of getting a bit more of a practical illustration of what's going on. So you can use this actually as in uh, like a tripod, I suppose, couldn't you? It's a bit low down, but it'd be useful for maybe long exposure photos and etc. Now I have the luxury here of, I just pop this off, an L bracket. So the L bracket means that I have mounting facilities at the bottom, I have mounting facilities at the side, and with the course of 7200, I also have here an Arco Swiss uh, mount, a handle, and a uh, leg, if you like, foot, I think they call them, and that enables me to mount it there as well. So I've got so many options to mount this uh, configuration, it's, uh, it's like crazy, isn't it? we we'll just slot that in there. I think I can slot it down, makes it a bit easy. There we go. Just make sure that's safe. Tight, there you go. So it's in there and tight and safe, and that's not going anywhere. That's never coming off. To secure it, I have a little strap here. I just made a simple little strap with a clip. And if you want to just be absolutely 100% sure it's not going anywhere, you can do that. And that just, of course, guarantees now it can't ever fall off the uh, camera case. So even if, should, these, uh, Arco, these Arco Swiss grippers uh, let go, the strap will just secure it, stop it dropping to the ground. And it's no inconvenience to get it off. It only takes a few seconds to remove that. Remove this, and however you mount it, you can mount it this way, I can mount it that way, I can mount it on the leg. You've got so many options. And you know how wonderful it is uh, to have the camera as I have it here. I'll just do it one more time just to illustrate how easy it is and how doable. To have the camera at your hand's height. So you're transporting this around, okay, so we're transporting it around, here we go. Moving it around from side to side, and when you want your camera, there it is. A few seconds, you've got your camera, you shoot. It's right at your hand height. You're not having to shuffle through a case, or go through a bag and muck around, get your backpack off and to put it down somewhere and find your camera. It's always there, ready to go at a moment's notice. Quick grip, quick access. So whether that be that speed light I had, attachment, or be the camera, brilliant idea to have this little uh, attachment on your hard cases, and it's any hard case, it's not brand specific. If you've got a Pelican uh, 650 or 1650, 1615, whatever, 45, whatever size case you've got, can be a Pelican, can be this brand, can be any brand. It's not important, they all have super strong handles. None of them have weak handles because you're just not going to be able to lift them up and they'd snap, wouldn't they? So they know that and they've made them very strong. So. I found I can use that as a mounting attachment, and I found that very practical and useful. And I just wanted to run you through and show you what I'm doing. Now you may notice, of course, today also, that I'm using a lav mic. This is a Deity system I'm using. I've got a remote to show in the back here. You can see that I have a uh, receive, uh, transmitter and I have a receiver on the camera, and then I'm using the little Deity uh, lav mic as well. And the reason I'm using this and not using my traditional uh, shotgun microphone that you may have seen me use many times is simply because of the motion that I'm doing here. You notice that I'm sitting down, then I stand up, then I'm putting things on the case, I'm putting things in front of me, I'm showing you uh, various cameras and lens combinations. If I've got a fixed microphone there, it's a real nuisance. I'm constantly banging it, it's in the way, it's in the middle of the shot. And so even though the sound quality is probably slightly reduced using a lab mic and not a professional mic, uh, it's uh, I'm happy to lose a little bit of quality on the sound to have the versatility and the ability to be uh, fully emotional with having to constantly adjust microphone heights and so on when I'm standing and sitting. So I just sort of run you through why I was doing that. I think the uh, lav mics are a great system. They don't use them on the news and broadcasting for no reason. When you're watching news, you'll see them always using the lav mics. So they're very versatile and practical. Uh, certainly, I like using them anyway, and I have several of them. And that's the thing about them, because they're so small and light, you can take many with you. So if you're doing videography, for example, you can have three or four of these lav mics around and you're really versatile. So I really like having the lav mics around. They're small, lightweight, and of course you can carry many of them. You can use them associated with your mobile phone. You can plug them in there and download an app, or you can use them in your camera or multiple cameras. And of course, with wireless transmitter systems like I'm using, it means that you've not uh, got cables everywhere, which can be very frustrating. So uh, anyway, that's what I'm uh, using the lav mic for this time around. I'll probably use them quite a bit when I demonstrate products. So I hope you've had some fun with what I've been showing you. Thank you for your time. Uh, it's been always uh, great to catch up. And if you have any comments you'd like to make, I'm always happy to hear from them and apply any advice you want to give me, as well as my uh, offering any advice or tips I have. So it's a two-way street. Feel free to communicate. And thank you for your time today.